it is good to be here and I give my condolences to Long Tim over in Jerusalem. How many of us would like to be over there with him? How many of us have been over there? There you go. Got a question. How many of us have been here? There's another one of these questions. How many people have been here coming to this church over the last 23 years, since 2000? Put your hands up. Wow. The rest of us applaud you and thank you for your resilience that you've stuck it through, that you've decided to continue no matter what. I didn't ask how many of you have been here ever since the day when people used to sit up the front here. Oh, look at that. And you're still here. How many of us have only been here this year? Fantastic. Just this year, 2023. How many of us have only been here? This, we've only been here a couple of times total for normal church. Anyone else? Welcome. For those first timers or, you know, only been here this year, what did the rest of you say? What have you said? You are applauded for your decision to come here and hopefully making this home and that you'll keep coming and that you'll gradually feel as though you belong. Let's see if this goes. Thank you for the story, Nadine, about peace. Uh, there it is on that screen there. We don't have quite this high-tech flute and stuff at Casino. Look at that. Do you all know what a prepper is? Got some reading to do. A prepper is somebody that's preparing for doomsday, the end of society, the end of the world. Now, I'm going to read this. Ruskoff is an author, theorist and professor at the City University of New York. He's saying that the event is a euphemism for the end of a society, which could be, an, which could be environmental collapse, social unrest, nuclear explosion, solar storm, unstoppable virus or malicious computer hack that takes everything down. These five men, we don't know who they were, these five men were mega-rich preppers convinced that society could collapse at any moment and were keen to get Ruskov's opinions on how to survive and thrive. Do we have any ameners here? One asked, which was the better location for a doomsday bunker, New Zealand or Alaska? Others already had their bunkers ready and security guards on standby. More questions came about these guards like, how would you pay them once crypto was worthless? What would stop them from eventually choosing their own leader? Perhaps robot guards would be better. Coming from the ABC last year. While many people have already moved to Tasmania to escape the heat in other states, some doomsday preppers are weighing up the island state as a post-apocalyptic option. I go out to Drake every now and then. And near that area there's this paddock which has uh, shipping containers and smaller containers there. And I didn't know what they were. I mean, there's weeds grown, they're looking a bit dilapidated, dilip- a bit worse for wear. I asked, 
That storage for the preppers. Oh, preppers out Drake Way. Look at that. I didn't know that. They, they exist. Some of us have probably, I remember talking to my brother quite a few decades ago about the idea of having, we called it a second coming block. Has anyone got a second coming block? A block getting ready for the second coming of Jesus. Having all the fruit trees, all that kind of gear. Got your Bibles, I hope. John 14. John 14, verse 27. Thinking about this prepping, I can't help but think of what Jesus said. Some of you may even know this off by heart. John 14, 27, and I'm reading as I usually do from the ESV. Peace, who's speaking? Jesus. Peace, I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Where are you? With regard to that peace. See that tree there? Can you see little figures in various places of the tree? Which one would represent you right here, right now, when it comes to the question of peace? Are you the fellow at the top wondering, well, what next? Are you the person on the swing? Are you the person on the limb? And then you discover that somebody's actually sawing your limb. Are you down on the ground, flat out on your back? Which one is you? Hopefully you can see some of it. When you see somebody being smacked in the face, I suggest that is good to feel unpeace about that. I suggest it's good to, it is good unpeace when you're praying for your neighbour's salvation, looking for further ways to get to know your neighbour. What happens if you are an employee or an employer and there's stuff happening? Are you at peace? What about getting here on time? Are you at peace with that? Particularly if you've got a car full of kids or a husband who doesn't know what a clock looks like. And you've got to be here at 10 to 11, is it? Is that when you start church? What about having showers and you have a large family and you have more than one shower, but somebody else is in the other shower, so consequently your, the temperature of your shower goes from hot to cold to hot to cold. Peace? Hardly. But even going bigger than that, when you think about all the stuff that's been happening around us, they're talking about us going into drought times again. If you're a farmer, what do you do? Remember, before the floods... There was a drought, there was bushfires. I remember visiting people out west of Casino and they've just arrived there and just seen trees blackened by the fires of uh, three years ago, was it? With the floods and everything, it's, it's just getting overwhelming. COVID. I don't know what I want to talk about COVID and the accompanying mandates the enforced vaccinations and people having been terminated from work, kids losing out of school and borders closed. Well, I just talked about it, didn't I? Bushfires. I think you know what floods are like. Did so well here in serving the community. The climate... Environmental issues, climate boiling they call it, 
COP27 in Egypt last year, went to uh, Mount Sinai, some of the people there, for praying. This year we have COP28 in Dubai, the beginning of December, where, and they're saying on the advertising that we are at halfway point. It has been seven years since Paris, with seven years to go to 2030. That reminds me of the Agenda 2030. And then we have war. And uh, thank you for that slide, that, 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 that uh, little movie clip at the beginning. Actually, it wasn't at the beginning. It was the Adra one, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm so thankful I'm not there. The economic uncertainty, the jobs, you know, what's going to happen with AI coming in? Gender fluidity, moral breakdown, mistrust of authority. Morality, if you like. And then, of course, relationship breakdowns and challenges. Divorces. Parents, kids. School, who am I going to be a friend with? All that kind of stuff. What did Jesus say? My peace, I leave with you. Not as the world gives you. And with all those things up there, where are you? Where am I in that tree called peace? We believe we are in the end times. Let's have a look at some three end time passages. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. 15 to 22. Matthew 24, starting at verse 15. Some of us will be quite familiar with this. I like to think. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, and let the reader understand, Jesus talking again, of course, just before he was taken to be crucified. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the house stop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. But alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. Verse 22, And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. When you see these things, what do you do? Flee. But how can you have peace when all this is happening? Luke 21 is similar, but let's just remind ourselves. Luke's parallel to Matthew. Luke 21, 20 to 22. Just a bit different to how Matthew records it. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that his desolation has come near. 21. Then let those who are in Judea do what? Flee. Again, how can you have peace when you're running for your lives? Doesn't quite make sense. We're familiar with Matthew 24. We know about Luke 21 and Mark's parallel in chapter 13. But John doesn't have a chapter. He has a whole book. What do we call it? on Jesus' last day, sermon on last day things. It's Revelation. Revelation 13. Let's go over to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, the second half. And now I'm not here to unpick all of this. But I want to make a point. And I think you may have heard it already. But let's read it. 
Revelation 13, 11 to 17, starting at verse 11. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom, that the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. And again I ask the question, how the heck can you have peace during that? I have enough problem having peace with my garden, let alone fleeing from without working out, should I comply or not? Should I do this or that? And I do take the position, by the way, that what we tasted the last few years is a foretaste of what I just read with regard to the vaccinations. Just a foretaste of what the power of the state has. Now I'm making no judgments upon those who did or didn't. It's just a comment upon the power. Jesus said, My peace I leave with you. Not as a world. Jesus has a special peace. Where are you in that tree? Just to perhaps push the point home, I want to quote and refer to a book I came across last year. You can see it up there on the, on the screen, The Psychology of Totalitarianism. by Matthias Desmet. He's a lecturer of psychoanalytic physiotherapy at the Department of Psychoanalysis and Clinical Consulting in Ghent University in Belgium. He stands there, he knows what he's on about. He's a clinical psychologist in private practice. And he says that there are four conditions in particular that have to be present in a society for large-scale mass formation to occur, or, if you like, for there to be a totalitarian state to exist. These were present prior to the rise of Nazism, think Adolf Hitler, and they're also present with the rise of Stalinism. And he claims that they are also present now. Did you hear that? The four conditions. First of all, generalised... Got to catch up here. Generalised loneliness, social isolation and lack of social bonds among the population. He, he, he believes that the digitalised conversations that are, that are had are very much associated with this. The problem is greatest in industrialised countries. About 30% in these countries report chronic experiences of loneliness and isolation and this percentage is increasing every year. The second, which follows the first, is a lack of meaning in life. Man, he claims, as a social being par excellence, lives for the other. Remove the bond with the other and he'll experience life as meaningless. 
he goes on to suggest that the phenomenon of worthless jobs, he spends a whole chapter in it, is perhaps the best illustration of this. In the second decade of the 21st century, half of the people were of the opinion that their job was meaningless. How much? Half. A 2013 Gallup World Poll suggested that only 13, 13% worldwide were truly engaged in their jobs. 63% were not engaged. They sleepwalked through their work. They may put time into it, but were not, were not passionate. 24% actively disengaged, meaning that they were actively demoralised and, de- and demotivate their colleagues. That's scary, isn't it? And I hate to ask... Those of you who work for pay, whether you find meaning out of your work. And meaningfulness out of work is just an example of the lack of meaning in life. Then he goes on to a third. Widespread presence of free-floating anxiety and psychological unease. This condition has been strongly present in the first decades of the 21st century. For example, the WHO, that's the World Health Organization, reports that one in five people worldwide has been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, which is likely an underestimation. The instances of mental suffering is even higher. This can be concluded from the enormous consumption of psychotropic drugs. For example, in Belgium, this person's home country, In Belgium, with a population of 11 million people, 300 million dosages of antidepressants are taken every year. That sounds like a lot. And this goes on to the fourth indicator. And it follows from the first three. There's a lot of frustration and aggression. There we go. Actually, did I refer to that? Constant risk of panic? One in five people? Yes, I did. Number four, frustration and aggression. The sharp increase of racial and threatening language on social media over the last decade, tripling between 2015 and 2020, is a striking example, he writes. What accelerates mass formation is not so much the frustration and aggression that are effectively vented, but the potential of unvented aggression present in the population, aggression that is still looking for an object. Is still looking for an object. So how exactly do these conditions lead to mass formation or, if you like, a totalitarian state? How does it happen? The catalyst, and it's up here on the screen, The catalyst for mass formation is a suggestion in the public sphere. If under the aforementioned circumstances, those four things, a suggested story is spread through mass media that indicates an object of anxiety, for instance, the aristocracy under Stalinism, the Jews under Nazism, or the virus, remember the fear concerning the virus when it first came? And later the anti-vaxxers, those who were against the vaccines, were held down and people were afraid of them during the coronavirus crisis. And by the way, this person is not an anti-vaxxer. He's nothing like that. He's just writing. Well, I've told you he's, what he did for a living. Uh, and at the same time, offers a strategy to deal with that object of anxiety. There is a real chance that all the free-flowing anxiety will attach itself to that object and there will be broad social support for the implementation of that strategy to control that that object of anxiety. Bit of a mouthful, isn't it? And so there's an emergence of a consistent narrative or story from government officials, mass media, etc., that exploits and channels frustration and anxiety. Folks, that's what we've been living through the last few years. Frustration and anxiety. What did Jesus say? He talked about peace, even during those times. 
My peace I give to you. Where are you in that tree called peace? And the problem of anxiety is enlarged, I'll suggest, in our church to do with faith. Any of you seen a photo or picture or painting like that? You're that little person. How do you feel? Who feels comfortable and happy? What about that one? You feel content? Was it my first year of pastoring? Quite some time ago. I went to see a church member up in the hospital. She was there because of anxiety. And she told me, Tim, (laughs) the nutshell of it was that the basis of her anxiety was a faith issue. She felt as though she was before God like that man and she was not good enough no matter what she did. She didn't feel good enough for the kingdom. If Jesus came, no way would she be able to make it. She didn't belong. She wasn't good enough. She had this sense of failure, of guilt and shame. And this problem of peacelessness is enlarged yet again. If there is a lack of connectedness happening in our faith community, our church, if you would. I mean, how many people, look around, how many people have you connected with today so far? Have a look, good look around. Just think, oh yeah, I've connected with that person. Yes, I've... You can look around, please look around. How many people have you really connected with today? What about the week just had? How many people have you connected with? How many people have connected with you? Loving relationships coupled with small holistic groups rate poorly in our church at large. This gives reason to a comment somebody made to me just the other week that they've been going on a road trip the last couple of months and they've visited church after church after church after church after church. You've heard the story. It is still true, folks. Too many of us say, G'day, but to engage and to connect, we struggle with. And this just adds to my sense that I am not worthy, I am not good enough, I don't belong. And the question I ask you, O Lismorians, particularly if you've been here for a little while, is what are you doing about it? It is something that we need to continually and deliberately tackle because it doesn't happen automatically. It's left to those who have the gift. Jesus, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Why would Jesus be saying that? I suggest to you that he's speaking as God. He's talking about a God peace. Because we are loved and accepted. Think of that father's arms around the young son after he returned home. That is the young son returned home. Think of those arms there and those same arms opening wide and extended for the older son. We can have that peace because we are loved and accepted. We can have that peace because we are are justified. 
Remember the Roman church with this racial religious tensions and Paul writing to it? And this peace allows us to, lo- to live freely in compassion even as Jesus did. Because I am loved, because I am viewed just as if I've never sinned, I therefore can respond in love. Some of you have come across this story before. In the opening salvos of World War II, a large British military force on the European continent, along with some English citizens and diplomats, retreated to the French coastal port of Dunkirk. I'm reading it because I can read it better than I can tell. With its back against the English Channel, a British army faced a German army that threatened to drive it into the sea to save what he could of his army, Winston Churchill called for all available sea vessels, whether large or small, to evacuate the soldiers and civilians from the besieged French beaches and bring them back across the channel to safety. That's the Dunkirk evacuation. Two weeks later, June 17, 1940, Churchill gave authority to a further evacuation called Operation Ariel. Off the French port of saint Nazaré. excuse my French or lack of, Three German Messerschmitts attacked the defenceless Lancastria, a converted cruise liner whose decks and hold were packed with soldiers. One bomb dropped directly down the ship's single large smokestack, tearing a huge gap in her lower hull. Nearly 200 men were trapped in the forward hold of the now severely listing ship. No one doubted that the liner was going down. Chaos, smoke, oil, fire and blood mixed with terrified cries of the men trapped below created pandemonium on deck as those hopeful of surviving searched for lifeboats or simply just jumped into the water. Moving through the middle of this living nightmare, a young Navy chaplain quietly worked his way to the edge of the hold and peered into the darkness below. Then, knowing he could never get out, he Load himself in. Survivors later told how the only thing that gave them courage to survive until passing ships could rescue them was hearing the strong, brave voices of the men in the hold singing hymns as the ship finally rolled over and went to the bottom with them. This is the punchline. How can we ever do that if we are not worshipping a mighty and gracious God whom we can fully trust? How can we do something like this if we're not assured of our own salvation, if we ourselves didn't have that peace which allows us to take our eyes off ourselves and look at others with our Father's eyes, with compassion and with his energy? Does anyone agree with me? Take home. What can we take home? Well, first of all, from Revelation 13, from Jesus' sermon on last day things, we know of the future to some extent. And that is when laws concerning worship are established, what are we to do? Flee. That's when we flee, when those laws are established. But it's interesting that when we come to Jesus, when he was taken by the soldiers in Matthew 26, what did the disciples do? Where did they flee? Read it for yourself. They fled away from Jesus out of fear. Psalms 91. I'm just going there. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. 
His faithfulness is their shield. In Butler, he will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday, etc., etc., etc. It's a song, it's a psalm for the last day times. Where, where, where are the people who sing it, who say it, flee? They flee to Jesus, not away from him. So concerning us and our future, yet again, Matthew 28. Let's go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 16 to the end. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we're familiar with that verse, aren't we? Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. This is the one. Behold, I am with you when? Always. To the end of the age doesn't say that I'm with you until the near the end. Then you've got to be by yourself. No, you're there. I'm here with you always, even to the end. That gives me security. Hebrews 13, 5 to 6. I will never leave you or forsake you. And goes on to quote, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That's a good question, is it not? At school, at work, at home, what can man do for me, to me? Fear not. He says. Of course, I've got to put in Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We need to encourage each other. That's what church is all about. That's why we gather to connect with each other, to encourage each other. So this is why we stick to Jesus like glue. This is why we uphold each other. And this is why we can never shut up about this Jesus, our Lord and our God. Amen. I just invite you, if you can, just to pray with me in closing. Father, we find it so easy to be scared. We find ourselves knee-jerking in all sorts of situations. And we just ask for your forgiveness again. And we accept it. Please just keep reminding us of how you view us, of your love. Father, please just energise us, remind us, do whatever it takes to spend that time with you so that we can be reminded and to be able to connect with each other so that we can encourage each other in this. Because at the end of the day, Father, we can have that which no one else can have, that peace which only heaven can give. We ask for it, our hands are held out and we receive it. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.